everybody. Hi, Guy. Hello. Oh, I am Stacy Brown. I'm one of the founders of Chicken Salad Chick. And thank you so much to Books A Million for hosting this fun event today. And I am so excited. Thank you to Guy Roz here is who we are talking to today. And this is such an honor, Guy. This is an absolute uh, I, um, Every time I'm asked to tell a story about the show, I always go to your story. So I'm um, likewise honored. I'm honored. It's so exciting to have to, to, to have you doing this. Oh my goodness. I I really and you don't you cannot imagine the pressure I'm under right now because I think you are the greatest interviewer and to be asked to ask you questions is a little is a little intimidating. So um I hope that I can do you justice. But thank you so much for asking me to do this. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, I think everybody that is joining us has purchased a book of um, the book that we're talking about today is Guy Raz's How I Built This. And I cannot say enough about this. Um, first of all, I really did not know um, what to expect. I know about the podcast. I know all about that, but I didn't know how it was going to come across in the book. And if you can see all of my um, underlining, I have been taking notes and I am passing my book down to my children because this book is full of unbelievable knowledge. And my, my favorite part about all of this book are your reflections your reflections that tie all of these wonderful stories together. And so I just want to congratulate you on, um, on this amazing book and the event. And I have to just tell you a couple of things before we get started with me asking you questions. But when your producers reached out to me back in April of 2018, I had not entered the world of podcast yet. And so they said um, that you were interested in interviewing me for how I built this and for me to go and listen to a podcast to see how that went. So I looked up James Dyson. Oh, my goodness, James Dyson. And it was an amazing episode. And then I saw Sarah Blakely and Mark Cuban and all of these industry moguls and icons and legends. And I thought, what why are they calling me is this like community service or is this like for amateur night why in the world and so i was um a little intimidated by by all of those people and then we got on the air together and i was a little nervous but when we began our interview all of that melted away because you are so warm and so relatable and kind and you really just bring out the best in your guest, and it is truly a gift. And the way that you bring out the truth and the vulnerability of these stories is why, as listeners, we tune in to you every time you're there. So thank you um, for sharing your gift with us. One of the nicest things anybody's ever said, and, and we loved telling your story. And of course, I do tell your story in the introduction to my book, because um, as many of you who have the book know, um, I tell the story about about my wife um, coming in from a run and um, just, you know, tears streaming down her face. And she said, why did you warn me about this episode before I went on a run? And it was, of course, the story of Chicken Salad Chicken and, and Stacy. And, um, and really, I, I think, you know, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit, but when I think about how I built this, I don't think about it as a business show. I don't, you know, business show to me is like something you would see on CNBC or Mad Money or Bloomberg, you know, one of those shows. I think of how I built this as a human journeys show, just told through the prism of business, that it's really a show about journeys, um, you know, about, about the, the drama of human life. And um, and that's your story. Your story is really one of the most incredible business stories we've had on the show. And so, um, uh, and so, thank you for sharing it. 
Well, thank you. And it's those stories, the way that you bring those stories to light makes it so relatable for all of us out there that think we have something entrepreneurial in us. And it really, um, it really just brings all those commonalities out there and, and helps us to see, maybe I can do it. Maybe I can do it. They did it. And to hear those stories from beginning to end. That's exactly why I make it. I make it because I want people listening to it or the people watching now to think of themselves as entrepreneurs. You know, I think, and, and it's funny because I know you probably 20 years ago, if I met you 20 years ago, I would say, Stacy, you're an entrepreneur. And you would say, me, entrepreneur? I, I'm not an entrepreneur. You might have said that. You might not have thought of yourself that way. And look at you now. I mean, you are, you know, not just an entrepreneur, but an inspiration to other people who, who want to create something on their own. And to me, this idea that we all have a spark within us to build something, to introduce an idea into the world or, or a product or a service, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be like a new rocket ship to the moon. I mean, you can introduce a product or service that still touches people's lives and change, changes people's lives like chicken salad, you know, like, like a, a gathering place where people can talk and eat and eat and, um, you know, with whimsical names, that's, that's the spirit of entrepreneurship. And I'm a really big believer in it because I really believe that innovation and creativity and, you know, the best of America and even, even the world comes through people putting their ideas out into the world and, and creating things. Absolutely. Okay, so now if you don't mind, this is so exciting that I get to turn the tables. So um, I am fascinated by how people develop into who they are based on a number of things, genetics, environment, circumstances, the influence of the people that have, uh, people have been surrounded by, what sticks in a memory, what fades away. So can you tell us a little about your parents and your upbringing and what they did for a living and how that shaped your future. Yeah, I mean, I think that I'm very fortunate. I grew up, first of all, in a, in a house with two parents. They're, they're no longer married, um, but, but when I was a kid, they were. Um, it was a difficult marriage, but they, um, we had a strong family. I have two older sisters and a younger brother. And my mom and dad, you know, family was a really crucial, central part of our lives. You know, um, it was family, it was being together, it was holidays. And my dad was an engineer. He worked for um, different companies throughout his life. And then my mother was a school teacher. And in their 40s, actually, when my dad was in his 40s and my mom in her late 30s, he decided to leave that all behind. To, to walk away from a safe job with benefits and health insurance and all those things to start his own business, which was a small jewelry store selling pearl in Los Angeles. And I remember as a kid, I was probably eight years old. Now, my dad had three kids at the time. He had an eight-year-old, a 16-year-old, and a 12-year-old. And all of a sudden, he gave up the safe career to leap into the unknown. And I remember as a kid watching my parents work late at night, going through like cold call lists and cold calling people and, and going down to LA and literally knocking on doors, trying to sell their pearls before they had their own office. And it was tough going, it was really hard work. But through a combination of persistence and determination and also luck, they were able to build a business. You know, it never, it never made them fabulously rich, but it was a business that, business that enabled my dad to a, employ other people, hire other people, and give them a, 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 a stable life for their families. And it enabled him to support a family and to support his kids who went to college. That is a huge achievement. I mean, it, being an entrepreneur, and creating something doesn't mean a billion dollar exit on Wall Street. To me, the, the definition of success is, is building a 
a, a, a sustainable life surrounded by people you love and maybe being able to support other people through employment. And that's that's what my dad achieved. He's now almost 80 and retired. And, you know, I, I think he can look back on his life and say, I succeeded. So needless to say, you're proud of him now. I can I can hear that. You're very proud of him now. At eight years old, what was your perspective? You know, not just myself, but even at 16, I, I, I remember the uneasy feeling of watching my parents really struggle through those early years. You know, and also just the late nights, you know, the late nights of working and going to jewelry shows, conventions, and um, constantly having to worry about whether they were going to make their sales goals that month. And, you know, sometimes a bad economy would affect sales because people don't buy pearls and jewelry when the economy slows down. Um, and, and when I watched that as a kid, it, it didn't seem like an attractive thing to me. You know, and in fact, I would say my parents really encouraged me, like a lot of people in my generation, to go to college and get a great, stable job. Maybe be a lawyer, become a lawyer or a doctor, not in my case, you know, a lawyer, or go work in finance, or go do something that, um, you know, where you get good benefits and a stable, safe career. And that seemed attractive to me when I was younger, even though I always had an entrepreneurial bent. I mean, I was the kind of kid selling lemonade and doing garage sales. And I, I had jobs from the age of 13. I worked at our local gas station in, in Los Angeles where I lived and uh, I cleaned, I pumped gas and I loved that because I would make tips. And um, so I always worked. I always loved earning my own money and not having to depend on my parents. It was always a just a point of pride for me. But really when I, when it came time for me to choose a career path, um, I chose a, you know, I wouldn't say a safe career path because I went into journalism, but I began my career working for an organization. Um, it was, you know, a stable organization where I got my health insurance and my benefits and all those things. And, and that seemed to be a safer path than the one that my parents took. Um, now, I, I would make a change later in life, but that's really how I kind of thought of entrepreneurship. It was too risky and scary and, you know, uh, unpredictable. And I was looking for predictability and safety and security. So knowing how that all has impacted your life and um, knowing you have two boys that you're raising now, right, that are nine and 11, does that all make you as a father super intentional about lessons with them or does it make you more relaxed knowing that things will develop as they should how do you feel about that as a father in hindsight looking at your childhood it's such a great question i i intentional and and look if i'm being honest stacy i don't know if my kid all that right you know like if i if 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 you were at my house and you were telling my kids about your entrepreneurial journey, they would listen. They would be wrapped. But you know how kids are. You know, your their own dad sort of um, wants to impart his wisdom and, and they're rolling their eyes. But I do really think about this a lot, which is, you know, I've got two young kids and I have big questions about what the future will be like for them. I mean, for us, for you and me, we went to college. You went to Auburn. I went to you know college in Massachusetts. That was the traditional path. You get a college, you get a degree, you get a job. I'm not so sure that's going to be the model in ten years. And maybe there may be a hybrid model. It's not clear to me. You know, both of my children are curious. They're readers. They're they love school. But you know. Whereas, you know, where, where, whereas five years ago, I would have thought a college is, is non-negotiable. Now I'm at a different place where I think, you know, maybe there's a world where they go out and they create a business or they just try to start something at a young age um, and see where it goes. You know, that that's something and I talk to them about this a lot. You know, I want my kids to feel like they can take risks and that they don't have to seek out a safe predictable, comfortable job. Because the reality is those jobs might not be safe, predictable, and comfortable in 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years from now. I mean, and in some ways, it's a good thing. 
Because as I said earlier, a world of entrepreneurs and small business owners and people running Etsy shops and proprietorships and convenience stores or creating products and services is is a is a, a really healthy world. Um, and in a world where people have a lot of agency over over the the course of the and the and the the direction of their lives. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Um, I have three kids, as you know, and I feel the same way in that I feel like if we just help them develop their passions and their strengths and skill sets, I'm not really concerned about um, exactly what that job or path is going to be. If we can just help them develop their natural talents, I truly feel like they're going to be successful. They just need to understand and discover those passions and and develop the confidence with it. So I'm right there with you. So when your boys reach the age of launching a career, knowing all that you know now, okay, knowing all that you know now, all of these hundreds of people you have interviewed, what advice are you going to give them as they launch into the world? It's the beginning of their career. The first advice I'm going to give them is get a job in sales. Now, I will add a caveat to that because very recently, and, and you will know what I'm about to talk about, you will know what I'm about to refer to, Stacey. Very recently, we took a road trip from where I am here in Northern California to Southern California, and we stopped at my kid's favorite California burger chain, which is In-N-Out Burger. And, and I know that many of you watching, if you've been to California, you probably stopped at In-N-Out Burger. It's the chicken salad chick of the West Coast, right? It's like a special place you go to. And my son said, um, when I'm 16, I want to work at In-N-Out Burger. And I was so excited about that because I love the idea of my kids really getting their hand, like really getting into it and, and doing hard, you know, doing hard work. I mean, working in an environment that's really not easy. Once they're ready to start their careers, their, their professional lives, I really would, would encourage them. And I would encourage all young people to spend a year in sales or marketing. Those are really crucial. And you you know this, Stacey. I mean, you know, you came out of university, you were a mom, and then you were making chicken salad. And you kind of, over time, learned about the sales and marketing side of it. But like most people, like me, you didn't have that experience. And now you needed to go through that journey, right? But can you imagine how different it would have been had you had four years of sales and marketing experience going into chicken salad chick, it would have been transformational and would have probably sped the process up and would have made you a little savvier at the beginning and, and me too, right? So I think there's a real advantage to having some experience, even if it's just a year in, in sales and marketing, sales in particular, because what sales does, and you mentioned Sarah Blakely, what sales does is it forces you to go door to door and put yourself out there. And it forces you to experience rejection and to hear people say, no, I'm not interested in the product or service, please leave. I, I've, I've made, this, um, I've made an, uh, mention of, of this example and I'm, I'm just gonna make mention of it here again because it's really interesting to me. Um, I, talk, I, I talked about it, um, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna brag for a moment, but I got, I got the chance to be on The Tonight Show a few times with Jimmy Fallon, who is the nicest, most amazing, kindest human. He is he is the real deal. Like who he is on TV is uh -huh. who he is in real life. He is truly one of the kindest humans I've ever met. And um, I got to go on a show in January again, right before this craziness happened. And um, and I'm going back on in a couple of weeks. So I'll oh. talk about be on. So just watch me for okay, it. Okay, I'm watching. And what's the what's the date? October second. I'll be back on. Okay, I'm watching October second. Um, and the story I told is about this very interesting experience that uh, I've had on how I built this, which is we've had a number of entrepreneurs who are Mormon. Okay. Now, you know, is it unusual? Is there a pattern? And what I, every time I interview a Mormon entrepreneur, I would say, what was it, you know, what, what, what they would tell me about their experience they had when they were younger. You know, most young Mormons go on a mission for two years at 19. They're sent to like 
Brazil or wherever, Africa or so somewhere to, you know, convert people. They, they're trying to basically get people to, to join the church. Well, you're, you're knocking on a thousand doors a week. Now you're getting 900 of the doors slammed in your face and Mormon missionaries have to be polite and friendly and kind and gracious and, and, and keep moving. Well, after two years of, of experiencing thousands of no's, these kids come back to the U.S. or Utah or wherever they live. They're 21. They're actually much better equipped to take on the world than the average 21-year-old. Now, I'm not saying you have to be a Mormon missionary. The point I make, I mean, it could be the Peace Corps. It could be the military. It could be some other experience where you deal with adversity. Having the experience of rejection and adversity early in your career gives you incredible advantages when you actually go and start a business. Because starting a business is a, as you know, is a series of rejections and failures. It's it's the health department shutting you down early on. It's the, you know, it's the 800 square foot, you know, little shack that that you know where the kitchen barely you barely have a kitchen it's it's people coming in and complaining it, you know it's all kinds of things right it's all kinds of hurdles and obstacles and if you if you experience that early in life it makes it so much easier to deal with when you face it as as an entrepreneur or 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 really is if you, when you face it trying to put out a radical or different or disruptive idea into the world it's so true. That is so true. And I think it's so difficult also for people to know, are the doors getting shut in my face because they can't see the brilliance of my idea? Or are the doors getting shut in my face because I can't see the stupidity in my idea? You know, what is the point of I'm going to push through and persevere because I've got a brilliant thing or I'm not listening <laughs> to what the right advice is. It's such a hard uh, determination for people to make. So it's, hard. It's so hard when you know you know. So let's take chicken salad, for, for, for example. You knew that there were people who were eating your chicken salad when you were walking around the cooler to PTA meetings. And, and to the teachers' lounges, and they were saying, Stacy, this is amazing. This is really great. Like, you should sell this at a shop. And then more and more people were saying that to you. So, so you knew in your mind that, and, and you knew that it was really good. You knew that you were, this is something you were really good at doing. And you knew that you had to put it out in the world because there were people who wanted this. And so that, that can be a powerful impulse to keep moving forward. I'll, I'll give you another example. There's another example of a, a Southern-based company. There's a, a razor called The Bevel, and we featured the, the founder on the show, Tristan Walker. Tristan is one of the most incredible entrepreneurs I've ever interviewed, in, in addition to you, of course. And Tristan, he is a black man, and, he, and, and many black and brown men have a challenge with shaving because curly hair can create razor bumps. And the, you know, the traditional Gillette razors with the five blades, actually um, they, they cut underneath the skin and they shave your hair too close. So many African-American and, and, and men with very curly hair need to use a straight razor. The problem is there was never a brand that was as you know, like Gillette, you know, well packaged and beautifully made and available, you know, uh, everywhere and like like there is the Gillette razor. So he came up with the bevel razor. He wanted this thing to be beautiful, to be packaged beautifully, to look like an i like an iPhone unboxing experience. He wanted it to be because it was unfair. Why, why should should men of color not be able to have the same op option when it comes to shaving? that men with straight or women with straight hair have. And he, he went to tons of investors who were very sympathetic, but they said, well, I just don't see a market for this. But he knew there was a market for it. I mean, Tristan knew it because all of his friends needed it. Everybody he knew his whole life needed it. He, he understood that so viscerally because of his own experience and the people he knew around him. And so the fact that he heard no again and again didn't dissuade him because he he just knew viscerally 
that the world needed to have this product. It needed to be out there. And so despite the difficulties and the challenges and the, and the moments of, of sadness, hearing no, he, he kept pushing because he really knew the world had to have it. And I think that when you know, when you know that your chicken salad has to be on the world or you know, your, if you're Stacy's pita chips, that has to be out in the world because people are gonna want it. That's a powerful, that's a powerful force. Um, and, I, and I think it, it, you know, it's one of the ways that enable people to keep pushing forward. Right. And along with those notes, just like you said, there are so many positives that reinforce to you. I know this is a good thing. I know this is a good thing. And maybe this group of people doesn't know it yet, but I know it better than they do. And I know it's a good thing. And I can relate to that. So um, journalism. Journalism seems to come with that natural skepticism and entrepreneurs, just like we just said, have to be eternal optimists. I think I've heard you say this. And so how have you reconciled these two character traits? Because you are both. And I also think, and I also think Stacey, that I would amend it a little bit, which is I don't think entrepreneurs have to be eternal optimists, but I think they have to be I have, I think they have to have faith in the possibility of things working out, right? Because I don't think anybody can be an eternal optimist. It's not, and, and optimism isn't a, just about blindly saying, oh, everything's going to be okay. Because of course there are moments in, in our own lives and in, the, and in the world that are difficult. We're living in a difficult moment now. I mean, you know, millions of, of, of us are, are, you know, at home or have kids at school and people have lost loved ones or can't attend funerals because of COVID and the economy is not doing well. And, and you know, there are environmental challenges and catastrophes in California and in, in, in Alabama where you are and hurricanes. I mean, it's a difficult time. But what I would say is that an entrepreneur has to, in some, some senses, really suspend uh, a belief or to sort of suspend any doubt of uh, any doubts they might have about um, not any doubts, but the, the the doubts that their business could 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 fail. Right. I mean, in a sense, it requires a, a, an unshakable belief in I wouldn't even say just in your product, but in in who in what you bring to the world, because really like your product is not chicken salad. Like your most important asset is not chicken salad. It's you. Like everybody watching this now, your most important asset isn't what you produce or sell. It's you. It's what you it's what you bring to the table. And you know that that to me is really an, an important kind of insight that took me a long time to realize, you know, and it took me a long time to understand that that was my important, my most important asset that I was bringing to the world. It wasn't, you know, my, my skills as a journalist or, or an interviewer, but it was the commitment, the passion, and, and the love that I have for what I do. Um, and, and that was, that's really how I was able to kind of see things from a different angle. Now, I, I think there's a value in having skepticism sometimes. It's, it's important, right? Because I mean, I remember the story you told on our show about, you know, I won't go into too much detail about it, but the invest early investors who really created a, a huge challenge for you. I mean, they really were not they, they were not operating in good faith to be general. I'm being very generous about this. They were not right. operating in good faith. And, you know, so skepticism sometimes is important, right, to help us avoid, hopefully avoid those kinds of situations. But it's not always possible. And ultimately, you know, you have to, you have to kind of err on the side of possibility that things, there's a possibility, a great possibility that you can make things work out. Um, but it doesn't mean that there isn't a failure and it doesn't mean there isn't setback. There's lots of setback and there's lots of failure. But ultimately, if you believe that, that building anything is a marathon, and not, you know, a hundred meter dash, then you know that it's 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 just going to take a long time. It's going to take a long time before 
you actually see the you know the fruits of your of your efforts and your labor and and i and and not saying it's easy it's it's not easy this is not something that you could just snap your fingers and wave a magic wand and you become optimistic it's hard work and i think you know i think with you i mean you had you know, I think there were moments when you were building your business where you had doubts and, and, and you had a partner who who could kind of boost you and, and, and give you a shot in the arm. And, and when he had doubts, you could do the same. And so there are a number of tools and tricks that we can all use to remind ourselves that that, that sense of possibility has to be our North Star. It just has to be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, I just have one more question before we go to um, some of the questions of our audience. And so you just mentioned um, co-founders. Kevin was um, the polar opposite of me and he was um, my co-founder. We were founders together and Chicken Salad Chick would not be possible if it were not for him. The skill sets of so many people are needed. It's never a one woman or man show, just like you have said. And in, I believe it's chapter five, find your co-founder. So do you have a co-founder? And who, and what are those, if you have a co-founder, um, what are those supplemental skills? Yeah, I mean, I'm very fortunate to have a, a co-founder in the building of of my family and and my life, which is my partner, my wife Hannah. Um, you know, I I and I say that. I mean, I've never thought of her that way, obviously, but um, but it's you know there are days where um, you know there are days where where I have setbacks or I'm not feeling as optimistic as I want to be. And and she's there to say, hey, you got this, and 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 vice versa, reverse. And I found that again and again with co-founders I've interviewed, which is the advantage to, to building something with somebody else is enormous, because there will be really difficult trying moments where you are going to feel really down and low. I, I have a one of my businesses is a production company for children's programs. I make a kids podcast for the own world and um and, and it's a children's media company that I co-founded with two friends of mine, Mindy Thomas and Meredith Halpern Ranzer. And it's been such a gift to be able to work with these two women because there are days where like I'm I'm not feeling it and they're just up and days where one of them is down and I'm like, no, we got this. Guys, this is this is, you know, it's it's hugely important. And you know, when it comes to my own personal life and even professional life having a person to talk to and a partner to rely on and and to kind of bounce ideas off is so invaluable and it doesn't have to by the way it doesn't have to be a romantic partner it can be you know it can be a friend it can be a sibling it can be somebody who you really trust in and and bring on as maybe an advisor or a mentor or something like that it's so important and it can be such a huge advantage especially when times get tough. Right. And those complementary skill sets are just so invaluable. So invaluable. Um, okay. So thank you. Let's go to um, our first question from one of our audience members. Let's see. Oh, I like this. So this is from Catherine. What was the most surprising thing you learned while writing your book? I think the most surprising thing I learned was something that I actually knew. And this is what's interesting. There's so many things we actually intuitively know as humans, right? Like, I'm sure a lot of you watching have read How to Win Friends and Influence People or, um, you know, some of these classic business books like Napoleon Hill, you know, Think and Grow Rich and that are written in the 30s and the, you know, and so much of it is intuitive. It's like, um, you know, the power of positive thinking yeah, you think in a positive way, you're going to be, you're going to have a positive outlook, you know, or you exercise, you're going to actually feel better. I mean, it's some of these things are just so obvious and intuitive that we don't. And it's funny because, um, you know, some of the messages in my book are messages that have been told by other entrepreneurial writers and other folks who have profiled entre entrepreneurs, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. 
um, you know, ways to think about conquering your fear. The idea that our greatest asset is ourselves. I mean, these are not, I'm not a seer or a genius. I didn't come up with these <laughs> concepts, you know, it's, it's, but they, they're recurring. They come up again and again. It's so clear. And I think one of the, one of the things that really, that just came into focus writing this book was that, and even though I, I understood this, you know, at, at a sort of a visceral level, I didn't really reflect on this, which is this. Every entrepreneur on how I built this is just like you at the beginning. They're exactly like you. They're nervous. People don't take their calls. Um, they don't have any experience. They don't know where to start. Um, they're kind of all over the place. They all start exactly the same way. And, and the difference between them and those who, ha who, who have not yet taken a leap is that they really just walked into the phone booth and put on the cape. Because the cape really doesn't actually do anything, but it makes you feel like it, it like you can fly. You know, I know I'm using a lot of metaphors here, but the, the basic idea here is that every single lesson that you that I have taken away from how I built this and the book is that entrepreneurship can be learned. Yes, there are some people who are just born to sell or just born to withstand rejection, but the vast majority of us are not. Most of us are afraid of rejection. Most of us are, are, are afraid of hearing people say our ideas are stupid. Most of us are afraid of people saying it's impossible, it can't be done. But if we can figure out how to just plow through that, all of us have the capacity to do all of the things that the people in this book, including Stacey Brown, have done. These are learned skills. These are learned attributes. And that really became so clear as I was writing this book. And it was ex it was an exciting revelation because I don't want people to think that entrepreneurs are, own, are born. I want people to understand that entrepreneurs are made. That's awesome. What is it, um, what question do the entrepreneurs on your show, what question do they find the hardest to answer? I mean, I ask everybody different questions and, you know, to, to be honest, I go into every interview with a lot of knowledge about the person. I've spent many, many hours reading about the person. We do a really deep research dive into every person's life. I want to, I almost want to know their life better than they do. But of course, there are always things that I learn every, in every interview that I didn't know. I mean, in our interview, there were so many things I didn't know and, 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 and that came out. And my job is to trigger memories because most of us don't remember every detail of our life, of our lives, right? But if you're asked questions in the right way and, and, and you're guided along a path, you, you start to see things in that path. It's like um, it's like a memory palace. Like if you start to remember your childhood home, I'm sure everybody here can remember every corridor and room in their childhood home. It's it's like seared in our memory. It's one of those things that we just, most of us have, this, this ability to remember our childhood home. And my job is to make the, 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 that childhood home, the stories come alive. And sometimes that happens by recounting a detail or a question that I'll ask like, well, what was the color of the wall in your bedroom? I mean, sometimes I've asked that question. Oh, you know what? It was red with green trim. And I remember one time my brother colored on it and my parents got so mad, you know, whatever it might be, which might lead to another thing. So it's there's never a single question that I ask everyone with the exception of my last question, which is luck or skill. What What was it that that you attribute your success to luck or skill. Um, and, you know, I would say that's a difficult question for, for most people. And actually it is, even though everyone who I interview now, who's familiar with the show knows it's coming, you know, in the early days when I interviewed people who were not familiar with the show, they were like, huh, I've never really thought about that. Now course, everybody's waiting for it at the end. But it's funny because even though they're waiting for it at that point, I've interviewed the person for like three, four hours. So they're wiped out, you know? They're like on the mat, yes. surrender. Yes, it's mentally exhausting. Right? And yeah. so oftentimes the question actually becomes a very difficult question for them to answer. And it's so interesting. And it, it really is, it, there's no right answer to that question. It's just designed to be 
a moment of reflection. And I love that. And I love that. So I, I think I think out of all the questions, that probably is still the most challenging question for people, even though they know it's coming. Well, I'll tell you, I didn't know it was coming. I did not know it was coming. And you are such a skilled therapist. I just want to tell you, I was in deep, intense therapy. And um, a lot of people ask me, um, I try to go to all of the openings that I can go to for chicken salad, chicken inevitably. And I'm talking to all the guests in line and at every opening, they always mention the podcast. Hmm. And um, so I know that people write into you all the time and, and you're probably very aware of your impact, but you have such an amazing impact on such a ginormous audience and it just continues to keep giving but so they always mention the podcast and they all think that we were sitting on a couch together because they feel like they have listened to an intense therapy session and that's what it feels like because you're so skilled at it's almost like channeling i mean we are channeling these memories and you are walking us down that path and i mean at, and i was in a studio in birmingham in a dark box with headphones on and when that interview was over i mean i was exhausted i put those headphones down and i said i think i just told it all <laughs> you got everything i had to give <laughs> but um you really have an absolute gift and um, I thank you for sharing and helping to share all of these stories so that all of us out there can relate to these, to the desires of being an entrepreneur. I, I mean, I can't, I can't benefit our audience and our listeners without the generosity of the people who come on the show. And I'm not, when I use the word generosity, I'm not asking people to give us money or to, you know, I'm asking them to be generous with their vulnerability. I, I don't want Mark Cuban to come on the show and be, you know, tough guy Mark Cuban. I want to get inside his head. You know, I want I want everybody to come on the show to really, to show us that they're human. Because all of us, it doesn't matter if you're a tough guy or whatever, however you see yourself, we all have anxiety. We will all experience that. We will all experience um, fear moments of sadness um I, I don't care who you are um and and so i my what i'm trying to do is to make sure that the person who comes on helps us see that because once we understand that and know that about the person we can see ourselves in them and we can understand that we are they are not that different from us and what they achieved is achievable i i i'm not saying that this is a panacea or a magic pill and that everyone's going to be a millionaire or a billionaire that's and that's not the point what i'm saying is that everybody who really believes in can can figure out how to believe in themselves and their idea can 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 find success and that word success isn't about financial success it's not about notoriety or fame it's about building something that 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 you put out into the world and that's that's a pretty great achievement. I mean, that's a pretty important achievement. Right. But it is that it's that point of vulnerability with the guest that the walls come down and we all begin to relate. And so um, that's wonderful that you can um, get us all there. So um, the next question from the audience is what inspired you to start the How I Built This Podcast and then and also the book? Yeah, uh, I was that 12 years ago, I had a chance to kind of take, take some time off from being a journalist. And I don't consider myself to be a journalist reporter anymore at all. That's not what I do. But um, I used to be, and I believe it or not, I was a war correspondent. I covered the Iraq War. I lived in Afghanistan. I covered. Uh, I lived in Jerusalem. I covered the Israel-Palestine conflict. I mean, I, that's what I used to do before I, I had kids. And in 2008, I had the chance to take a year out and to do a fellowship at a fancy school in Boston called Harvard. 
and I got to take a class at Harvard Business School. I was just interested. And I was absolutely amazed at how they taught business school because I had no idea, I didn't know this, but the way they teach business school is through the case study method. And basically it's stories. You're given stories of entrepreneurs and you learn about how they built their businesses. And I was blown away because they were so interesting. And I, back then I thought, we can, we can do this in audio. And, and, and I have been a storyteller my whole life and I've worked with incredible storytellers in public radio. And I thought, wow, we could do this in such a compelling way. But I kind of shelved the idea for, you know, another eight years because um, I wasn't ready to do it. I, I still needed to be in my own competence to do it. And finally, after, you know, kind of slowly but surely, you know, having a bit more success as a broadcaster, and as a journalist, um, I finally had the confidence to put it out into the world. And and that was uh, four years ago I started working on it. We launched it four years ago. And it's kind of a similar story to the book, which is, you know, we, we started to hear from so many people that how I built this was like their free business school. And that's so, um, it means so meaningful to me that a show like ours could actually be thought of that way, that people were listening to this show and taking notes and really absorbing the lessons in, in, in the same way that a business school student would. In fact, there are business professors around the country and the world who use How I Built This as their curriculum. So I wanted to create a business book for the rest of us. You know, not just for people who want to start a business or who are in, interested in starting a business, but for people who are really need need inspiration. People who just need like, that kind of you know shot in the arm to set off ideas in their mind and and ideas that may not even be a business but might be something that they do in their community you know let, let's say you work for a big company and you really want to change something in the company that takes courage that takes entrepreneurial thinking let's say you're a member of a church or, or another community organization and you want to change something it takes courage and some people, a lot of people are going to say, no, we don't want to change this. But you have an idea that you really believe in. The, the, the book is really designed to inspire that kind of thinking, to just trigger, you know, just trigger thoughts and ideas. Now, of course, it's organized in a very methodical way. It's sort of a how-to from the very beginnings of, of coming up with an idea. And it takes you through different steps when to prove it. When to think about raising money, when not to raise money, how to think about a co-founder, how to market your product, how to build buzz, how to create word of mouth marketing, um, all told through stories and narrative. You know, I wanted this book to be very different than the traditional business book because I didn't want it to be abstract and theoretical. I wanted it to be very story driven. Um, and that's 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 why that's why I put it out there. Well, I believe it should be on the syllabus of every business class. It is it is really amazing. Um, okay, so our next question is from Katrina. And she said at the um, end of every show, you feature how, um, how you built this. How do you select these upcoming entrepreneurs? This is a feature we started pretty early on um, called How You Built That. How you built that. And... Um, it really was designed to highlight small businesses because, you know, the, the, the businesses we do on How I Built This are generally big, you know, um, usually at least 50 to $100 million companies and and sometimes billion-dollar companies. Um, and the reason why we focus on bigger businesses isn't um, – it's simply because we want to – get the, the sort of the full the full journey you know we, we really want to get to a point where we can really trace all of the, the challenges and struggles that it took to get to where the business is now and the other thing is that you know we it, it's not that it's not that I, I i'm not inspired by small businesses just that there are other shows that focus on smaller businesses and you know for us we always look to, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're looking for companies and brands that people might recognize and, and would, will, you know, was kind of um, spur them to listen. So we started this, um, this segment at the end of the show called How You Built That to focus on 
small businesses, Etsy shop, not, you know, little little um, craft stores or people who are making small um, scale products. Um, and really the way, the, the way we got those ideas was people would submit them. We had a website, build.npr.org. People could submit their stories and we received tens of thousands of them and we would go through them and, and we would, um, you know, we would pick one every week. We have for the moment during COVID time stopped doing it. And the reason why is because we introduced two new episodes of our show every week. So how I built this used to be one episode on Monday where, you know, this week we released a new episode with Sal Khan of Khan Academy. It's so good. You should check it out. Such a cool story. But we, we introduced a new series called the How I Built This Resilience series. So that happens every Tuesday and Friday where we do a shorter half hour conversation. Today, I interviewed the founder of Lyft, John Zimmer. Um, and it was really interesting, really interesting because he was on the show two years, three years ago. And, and they've had a tough time. So th this mini show that we're doing twice a week is designed to also to reassure people that even these business titans are going through tough times right now. Um, and because we introduced that new show, just we have, a believe it or not, a very small team. We had to momentarily sunset how you built that. And hopefully we'll bring it back. But for the time being, we're just so overwhelmed with trying to keep trying to put three shows out a week with our small team that um, we had to, we had to stop that for the time being. So I'm sorry, but we will try to go back. Well, and I don't know how you have time for all of this because I failed to mention at the beginning that you are also the creator of wisdom from the top and wow in the world. So I don't know how, how in the world you are doing all of this as well as um, raising your boys. So. I mean, it's like how do you own 170 franchises? You know, you have an amazing team. Well, I don't have to run 170 franchises because we have amazing entrepreneurs that are franchise owners and, and they do a fabulous job. Right. But it's still, I mean, you're still the, you represent the brand and, and you've got to oversee this business and you have a really important role. And I think your answer to that question will be, you have an amazing team of people and I'm very lucky. I've worked with some members of my team for 15, almost 20 years um, on different shows in my career. So I have an amazing group of people I work with. And many of the people on my team were also f interns. The, we, we have a really great system where we've, we, we attract really high caliber interns and then keep them and train them up and they become our producers. And so um, that's how I can do it because I have an incredible, incredible team that is just so gifted. So important and just absolutely a must for everybody to be able to execute what we're all trying to do. Um, is there somebody that you're going after that you want to get on your show that you've not had yet? You know, we from time to time we have approached people and usually if we don't hear back from them or, or they're, um, we kind of just move on um, mm -hmm. in part because we want people to come on the show who want to be on the show. You know, I've been in, in the media business for so long, Stacy, that I know how the game works. Here's how it works. You have a show, you really want a guest and you go after that guest and the guest has a PR person and the PR person calls you up and says, look, um, my guest will come up, my, my client will come on your show, but they won't talk about this. They won't talk about that. They won't accept questions about this or this or that. I can't do an interview that way because my audience won't accept that and I won't accept that. We have to be able to have an honest, full 360 degree conversation about warts and all. It's really important because I don't want people listening to our show thinking, God, these entrepreneurs are perfect. Their lives are perfect. They did everything right. They were so smart and perfect. No, I want people to hear, hear the show and say, God, that person was a screw up too. You know, that person made some stupid decisions or made terrible mistakes, but, but now I can, I can relate to them better because no one's perfect. We're all flawed. So we really do focus on people who want to be on the show. Of course, there are some entrepreneurs that we've reached out to and, and have come back and tried to do it, but under these conditions and, and, and our responses totally get it. When you're ready to come on the show without conditions, let us know. We'd love to have you on. And, and that's basically our approach. So we've been very lucky. We've been able to interview pretty much everyone we want to interview. 
Um, and and the few that we haven't been able to interview, you know, we'll, we'll happily wait until they're ready to come in that spirit of generosity. Right. Well, I have to tell you that I'm just in absolute awe of your career. Look, I mean, how many entrepreneurs are in this book? 300, how many? Well, we've had about 300 shows that I've interviewed and in, in the book, probably about 90. Oh my goodness. Well, um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing all of the stories. Thank you for bringing us in to the therapy session that you all put us through <laughs> because um, it is it's quite a journey for all of us. I, I get emotional talking about it because it is, it's a journey, it's a roller coaster. And to relive that with you um, through your interviews, I truly believe and have been told by so many people that have listened to it that that's what they needed to hear. They needed to hear the roller coaster. They needed to hear the truth and the vulnerability about someone's journey to know that they actually do have the courage within them. They actually do have what it takes, but they just needed they needed to hear that it can be done. And you do that for so many people. And thank you for sharing your gift with all of us through your podcast and now your book. And um, so I have to show you what came in the mail today. Christmas gifts. <laughs> 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 I hope you got a bulk discount. I don't know. I don't know if I got a bulk discount, but I am going to go through and I'm going to highlight and I'm going to underline all of my favorite things for people before I send them out. And uh, um, thank you so, so much. I really, you are such an inspiration. It's so fun talking to you. You were going to come to our How I Built This Summit in San Francisco that was supposed to happen next month, but unfortunately we can't do it because of COVID. But I'm hoping hoping that we can do it next year and, and I'm hoping you will come when we can do it. Well, I absolutely will. If you will have me, I will be there. And um, so thank you. I'm glad, thank you for asking me to do this. I still got to chat. So and it was fun. more fun that I got to ask you questions. I feel empowered. So fun, and um, and I'm so and it's so excited that Books a Million did this. Based in Birmingham, Alabama, you're in Auburn, and like to have you do this. And Books a Million, you guys are awesome. Thank you for supporting the book. Thank you, everybody watching for buying the book and 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 being a fan and of the show. And and I hope I hope it inspires you. I really do. I I and and if it does, write to us and tell us your stories, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Books A Million. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I hope to talk to you again soon, Guy. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody.